السلام عليكم جميعا نرحب بكم في هذه الندوه الخاصه اللي تعقدها ديوانيه المستقله كما اعتادت وهذه الندوه مخصصه لموضوع مهم واعتقد شغل بال الراي المثقفين او شغل بال المثقفين العراقيين من خلال الاطلاع على السوشيال ميديا كثير ما شفنا يتناقشون ويتحاورون حول التغيير الذي حصل نتيجة الانتخابات الأمريكية وفوز بايدن والتساؤل حول ماذا ستفعل الإدارة الجديدة في الشرق الأوسط وبخاصة في موضوع العراق وتحديدا هناك موضوعان شغل الرأي العام الموضوع الأول إيران كيف ستتعامل مع إيران وهل أن بايدن وإدارته هما نسخة مكررة من أوباما وبالتالي هل يمكن أن نتوقع أن العراق والمنطقة ستمر بنفس المشاكل اللي مرت بها بعد أن أطلقت إدارة أوباما يد إيران في المنطقة أو أنه هناك اتفاق جديد طبعا أيضا العراقيون يناقشون كثيرا موضوع تقسيم العراق يرجعون دائما إلى خطة بايدن ويتكلمون عن خطة بايدن أو ما طرح بايدن بال2007 حول الفدرالة أو الفدراليزم للعراق وتقسيمه إلى ثلاث أقاليم هل سيتم ذلك الآن؟ هذه المواضيع وغيرها رح أعتقد اليوم المتحدثون والسترند رح يناقشوها أنا أشكر شكر جزيل ويانا اثنين من أهم الباحثين في واشنطن والمتخصصين في موضوع الشرق الأوسط وأعتقد سيكون نقاش غني ومثمر وأتمنى لكم كل الموفقية شكرا ستيف شكرا ويل على كل على وقتكم وعلى استجابتكم واتمنى لكم جود لك سترند تفضلي شكرا دكتور منقذ واهلا وسهلا بالحضور والمشاركين اللي ويانا انا راح ادير الجلسه اليوم فاحب اول شيء انه اعرف بالباحثين اللي ويانا ابتدا ب ويل وكسلر اللي هو مدير مركز رفيق الحريري ومدير برامج الشرق الاوسط في المجلس الاطلنطي اللي هو الاتلانتيك كونسل وسابقا كان ويل وكسلر اثناء ولايه الرئيس باراك اوباما شغل شغل منصب نائب مساعد وزير الدفاع للعمليات الخاصه ولمناهضة الإرهاب وأثناء ولاية الرئيس كلينتون شغل منصب المستشار الخاص لوزير المالية ودير مكتب المخاطر الدولية في مجلس الأمن القومي وكذلك معاون خاص لرئيس هيئة الأركان المشتركة في وزارة الدفاع الأمريكية انتقل إلى الأستاذ دكتور ستيف كوك دكتور ستيف كوك زميل أقدم لدراسات الشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا في مجلس العلاقات الخارجية Council on Foreign Relations وهو خبير في شؤون الدول العربية وكذلك تركيا وخبير في سياسات الولايات المتحدة مع الشرق الأوسط وهو كاتب وباحث على نطاق واسع وله كتب عديدة عن الشرق الأوسط منها كتاب عن الديمقراطية والاحتجاج والعنف في الشرق الأوسط الجديد وكتاب بعنوان الصراع على مصر الذي حاز على جائزة ذهبية من معهد الشرق الأوسط وكتب كتب عديدة أخرى وفي العام القادم سينشر كتاب بعنوان مثير برأيي هو نهاية الطموح ماضي وحاضر ومستقبل 
الولايات المتحدة في الشرق الأوسط الذي أتطلع إلى قراءته الدكتور كوك حائز على الدكتوراه من جامعة بنسلفانيا ويتقن العربية والتركية أهلا وسهلا بكما وإذا تسمحون إذا ما كمانا أود أن أبدأ بأستاذ ستر سترن سوري فور انترابشن لأنه الأودينس مدى يسمعون الترجمة بليز نقول لهم للأودينس إنه تريدون تسمعون الترجمة روحوا على خيار اللغة العربية خيار اللغة العربية موجود عندكم مرسوم البرتغالية البرتغالية إيه احكي رانت البرتغالية 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 مكتوب عندكم إذا تروحون على علامة الكرة الأرضية موجودة جوا روحوا اختاروا البرتغال أو البرتغال وراح تسمعون الترجمة باللغة العربية أنا آسف ما نبهنا على هذا الموضوع شكرا دكتور منقذ ممكن ننتقل إلى ويل وكسلر راح أطلب من كل متحدث أن يتحدث حوالي 20 دقيقة وبعدين ننتقل إلى النقاش تفضل Mr. Wexler. Well, thank you very much for having me, for being involved in this conversation. I really appreciate um, this opportunity and, and look forward to uh, a discussion more than a monologue. So I will, I will speak for some period of time um, and uh, then very much look forward to any questions um, that people have. I'm going to um, uh, talk about four things um, very quickly. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what the overall uh, goal of US policy should be and how we should approach policy towards Iraq. Um, then I'm going to talk about um, the uh, about Biden's um, uh, about the implication of a Biden administration for Iraq. Then I'm going to talk about the context uh, uh, of the region um, and of for US policy in Iraq. And then I'm going to talk about some very specific policies that um, that Biden will have with some of the neighboring countries, especially Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Um, uh, so let me let me begin um, briefly. Uh, first and foremost is my firm belief that um, US policy towards Iraq, certainly for the last um, uh, 15 years, um, has been fundamentally flawed. And we have a new opportunity now to fix it at a very basic level. The fundamental flaw is that US policy towards Iraq has not actually been about Iraq. It's been about different, three different things. It's been for some, at some moments in time, it's been about terrorism. At other moments in time, it's been about Iran. And the, the most important thing in Washington is it's been about um, different sides of the political um, uh, debate, trying to win, deb win arguments that they are upset that they haven't been able to win previously. So for some, they're still upset that they haven't been able to win the argument that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was wrong. For others, they're upset that they haven't been able to fully win the argument that the surge in 2007 was right. For others, they, uh, they want to argue about the withdrawal in 2011. Um, in order for uh, the United States to um, have, have a fully successful Iraq policy, it needs to be about the future of Iraq and the future of the Iraqi people. Um, and if it is about those things, then actually the United States in partnership with our friends in Iraq can um, have the best chance of succeeding in some of its other uh, interests. But it needs to be fundamentally about the future of the Iraqi people and the Iraqi state. Um, and it needs to be perceived that way. And for too long, it is not. Um, let me now talk quickly about, about, uh, about President-elect Biden. Um, the, the, I have, there is great news, there is good news, and there's bad news. The great news is frankly that Joe Biden was elected and Donald Trump was defeated. <laughs> um, because whether or not folks realize it, uh, uh, four more years of President Trump would have resulted, I firmly believe, in a near complete US withdrawal, not just from Iraq, but from the wider region. Um, President Trump was lots of things, 
but um, uh, uh, but he was also extremely transparent about what his desires were. And anytime he was given an opportunity to speak on these subjects, the first thing that he said was his desire to withdraw from the Middle East entirely. Um, uh, and not just from places where there, where we had or uh, uh, conducted military operations or were, were, were still conducting military um, uh, uh, kinetic operations, but even from protecting the freedom of navigation um, in the Gulf. Uh, he spoke very clearly about his desire to end that mission. So, um, so the best thing is that um, that is not going to happen. Um, and uh, 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 Joe Biden, um, is fundamentally uh, an, an American internationalist. He comes from that generation um, where, uh, uh, where the United States being engaged in the world, working with its partners and allies um, was at the core of the United States role in the world. Um, and that's how he'll approach it. He's also a institutionalist. Um, he believes in multilateral institutions uh, he believes in alliances. He believes in uh, in partnerships, um, and he is also very much a um, uh, a believer in individual personal relationships um, at the top level and the values and the value of those. Um, so you add all that together, and I don't see the likelihood of Joe Biden withdrawing from the region. I see him trying to manage um, the relationship in the region, and so that's very good news. That's the great news. Um, the good news is that um, both Joe Biden personally and many of the people that he'll have as his top advisors have spent a great amount of time uh, thinking about Iraq, working on Iraq, talking to leaders in Iraq, um, uh, discussing U.S. policies in Iraq. Um, there is perhaps no, over the last 20 years, no um, foreign policy issue from the United States has Joe Biden been more involved in um, than, uh, than Iraq. So, um, you, uh, so for Iraqis watching this, um, uh, that is a great benefit to have an American president so familiar um, with, uh, with the issues um, at stake. That's the good news. The bad news is that uh, President Biden, from an Iraqi perspective, has a mixed track record um, on, uh, on Iraq. Um, and uh, uh, whether it was, um, and he has been criticized in the United States uh, from many audiences for, for, this, um, for this track record. He was uh, in support uh, when he was in Congress of the decision to invade in 2003. He was against the decision to um, conduct the surge uh, uh, and support the sons of Iraq uh, that were rising, um, that were um, the, the counterterrorism efforts that were going on during that time. And he was the leading um, uh, architect in the Obama administration of uh, what became the, with, the withdrawal, withdrawal of US forces in 2011. Uh, which um, opened the door, of course, for the Islamic State to, um, to return. So, um, uh, so, so that's the great news, the good news, and the, and the bad news. Um, what I do think, however, is that um, uh, President uh, Biden, when, he is, when he's inaugurated, and the people around him um, will not approach this issue in a, um, in, a, in a sort of fundamentalist way of trying to win the old political battles. They're going to, I suspect, look at the issues of Iraq in a much more prag pragmatic focus of what is possible to achieve at this moment, um, to look at the lessons, the successes and failures of their own, of their own experiences and try to um, look at the successes and failures of the Trump administration's and the Bush administration's experiences and try to apply those in a very pragmatic, um, uh, you know, results-oriented, realistic-based um, approach towards, um, uh, towards uh, policy towards Iraq. That's my expectation. And you've already seen that in, um, uh, for instance, Tony Blinken, 
who was recently nominated to be the US Secretary of State, um, he has spoken quite clearly about um, the failures uh, uh, that the, um, uh, of, the, of the Obama administration that led to the rise of the Islamic State that led to the, um, uh, uh, the collapse and the civil war in Syria. Um, these are things that he has uh, talked openly about, about the lessons to be learned. So, um, so, um, so my hope is that there's, uh, that there's a, and my expectation is that there's a real opportunity for pragmatism here. And happy to talk more about that in the questions and answers. Let me go on to the, to the last two things, the context and then some individual policy, policies around the context. Um, most important context for the United States is a political one which um, the American public is, uh, is tired of, of, uh, of endless wars. The American public is, um, is exhausted by the loss of money and, per and people and lives. Um, uh, this is not specific to Iraq. This goes uh, much wider. Um, and it's a, it's a political dynamic that any president has to, has to deal with. But again, as I said before, while I believe President Trump would have um, accelerated um, the, uh, that, that dynamic, fed into that dynamic and made policies on a basis of that isolationist dynamic. I see um, uh, a President Biden as looking to um, push against that dynamic um, uh, and uh, right size um, uh, our approach to so many of our continuing operations. Um, and based fundamentally focus on what US interests are. And what are those interests? Those interests have been established for quite a long period of time. They don't change with administration. They include uh, uh, the energy resources of the region, ensuring that they continue to be extracted and continue to, to be delivered to where the markets take them. It includes uh, a general interest in stability, security, and prosperity for the region. It includes an effort to ensure that weapons of mass destruction um, in the region um, are limited and certainly cannot be used to, um, uh, to attack or intimidate American, America itself or its allies. Uh, includes counterterrorism um, interests to make sure that entities in the region do not um, uh, kill Americans at home or abroad um, and our friends. Um, uh, it includes Israel, undoubtedly. Um, and includes in the context of a Biden administration, much more so than a Trump administration, an interest in supporting those who are uh, committed to um, the basic, um, uh, basic commitment to democracy, to human rights, and to those values that connect the American public to so many populations abroad. Um, those interests remain the same, but the region is fundamentally changing. And I'm happy to go into this at, at uh, a greater length in the questions and answers, but the way that I see the region is that the most powerful single dynamic that is affecting the largest number of decisions in the region uh, is the widespread perception of American withdrawal. And friends, uh, allies, partners, and adversaries um, all alike are taking actions right now in order to position themselves to fill the vacuum that um, is already being created by the perception of withdrawal um, and is anticipated to accelerate in the future when withdrawal becomes more uh, clear. Again, I, I think that this perception personally is overstated if you look at the actual reality of American uh, uh, power and, and interest in the region. Uh, but the perception is there um, and, uh, and it's real. And so what is happening is, uh, uh, four, is, is three major non-Arab uh, powers have been significantly expanding their, their reach into the region, um, uh, trying, to, um, uh, 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 trying, to, trying to meet long-standing goals for their power there. And that's Iran, Turkey, and Russia. Uh, China is not yet a player in this game. It is a e massive economic player, but it is not yet a geopolitical pow power. It, it, it will be there eventually, but not, but not now. 
um, his, historically, if any of these powers were to move into the region, you would have uh, Arab leaders in, um, uh, in Baghdad, in Damascus and in Cairo, all standing up to them very powerfully. Um, uh, in today's circumstances, um, they are less well positioned to do so. And so what you're starting to see is a new coalition forming between Israel and the Gulf states um, that, are, uh, that, are, that are trying to position themselves um, to do so. So that's the overall picture of the, of the region. And so I'll conclude in my last few minutes that I have of just talking about what I expect to be Joe Biden's policies towards three um, uh, key countries that are related to this, the, the new environment that I just described. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Um, uh, in regards to Iran, the, the Biden uh, campaign was clear on their views and that they saw value in the, uh, uh, in the nuclear agreement that was made between the Obama administration and Iran uh, and the general de-escalation of, uh, of tensions that followed. That they, uh, that they opposed the Trump administration's decision to withdraw from that agreement, and that they desired for uh, a, a movement back towards uh, compliance for compliance, that if Iran was to move back into compliance, then the United States would move back into compliance. Um, I think that what you'll, I suspect that what you'll see uh, initially is a significant um, outreach by the uh, by Biden administration to restart diplomacy um, towards those ends. Um, but, uh, but I am uh, personally a little skeptical about the likelihood of, um, of those uh, being able just to, uh, re you know, turn back the clock. Uh, the region is different, Iran is different, um, uh, uh, I think that there are confidence building measures that can be done. I think that there are uh, de-escalation measures that can, that can be done. I think that there are incremental improvements, um, uh, but, uh, but I'm skeptical about the, um, the possibility of, uh, of having a full on new agreement. Um, we'll see. Um, uh, but I think, again, the Biden administration, unlike the Trump administration, will, will, will organize their um, diplomacy around that possibility um, and test it. Um, Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, are, uh, as compared to Iran, are partners of the, uh, of the United States, but they will have significant um, issues uh, with a Biden administration. And these are, um, and remember, as I said at the beginning, President Biden, um, uh, uh, he, he uh, whole, puts significant value on personal relationships at the very top. That's his, uh, uh, that's what I see when I look at his history. Um, he has uh, made, uh, uh, he, has, he has said that he will uh, make Saudi Arabia and specifically Mohammed bin Salman um, uh, turn them into the into the, be seen as the pariah they are um, because uh, following the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, I suspect that what that means at the end of the day is not action right away, but a period in which there is a formal review of U.S. Saudi relations of the interests that bind those relations and the challenges that, um, uh, that have emerged in those relations. And to see if, um, if, an, if an understanding can be reached between the United States uh, and MBS um, on, the, uh, on, on, a, on a mutually acceptable way forward. But those will be difficult um, and challenging um, discussions. Uh, and that, in that respect, Saudi Arabia will be not entirely dissimilar to the approach that the United States takes with Turkey, where it's an important country and important deep, deep relations, um, but, uh, but there are challenges uh, with, the, with the individual leaders. On, on Israel, the, the US-Israel relationship is going to remain strong. There is no question about that. The security relationship, the intelligence uh, uh, relationship. Uh, uh, however, um, you know, when uh, uh, that uh, Bibi Netanyahu um, uh, uh, 
and had a very difficult relationship with the Obama-Biden administration um, and uh, was perceived um, to have been involved domestically in US politics in a very partisan way, aligned with the Republican party against the Democratic party um, in a way that was very different than his predecessors had done. And that continued through the Trump administration very clearly and very evidently. So the onus will be on Bibi Netanyahu to, I, to, to see if he can um, repair that. I take the, the last thing I'll just take note is to, um, uh, so I think I've hit my 20 minutes, is to, um, is that when uh, uh, a, um, an Israeli commentator said on Twitter that don't worry, um, BB has known Joe Biden for 40 years, that uh, Martin Indyk, um, who, uh, who managed US policy towards the Middle East in many, multiple administrations, quickly came back and said, that is true, and yes, and uh, uh, and Joe Biden is also knows BB Netanyahu for forty years. <laughs> so that 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 concludes my my overall view. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Shukran, uh, Will Wexler. ننتقل إلى الدكتور Steve Cook. تفضل. Shukran, Safira, and. Good evening to all of you. I talk a lot of Arabic, but a lot of English is less than me. I'm a bit of a jiddin jiddin. I could repeat much of what uh, Will had to say and underline it and reinforce it. Um, I'll I'll do it though in a in a somewhat different way. Um, with going, I want to start very broad and then kind of wend my way down to. Uh, talking a bit about Iraq. I think that um, folks in the Middle East, people in the Middle East need to be cognizant of the fact that um, President Biden has an extraordinary domestic political agenda ahead of him. Um, we are going to be dealing, despite the very good vaccine news, we're going to be dealing with uh, COVID-19 uh, he'll be dealing with an economy that has been ravaged by the pandemic. Um, there are issues of racial justice that we have not seen in this country in 40 or 50 years that need attention. Um, and uh, President Biden has committed himself to healing the deep political cleavages and polarization of the country. Um, and I think it, much of this is born of, is the result of the fact that not only do we see the country in a state that is quite worrisome after four years of President Trump, um, our institutions have been weakened. Uh, the norms that uh, underline our uh, institutions that are uh, admired around the world um, have been uh, tremendously weakened. And importantly, in order for the United States to have an effective foreign policy, it does need to get its own house in order. And I think that that is going to be uh, a priority of uh, a Biden administration. Now, it is also a recognition that the world is a very different place from when uh, then Vice President Joe Biden left uh, the White House in 2016. So these things combined um, are going to push the Middle East down uh, on the president's agenda. Um, whereas uh, when President Obama came to office in 2008, one of the first things that he had to deal with besides an economic crisis was dealing with what to do with uh, the situation in Iraq. All that being said, I think that there are a number of issues that are going to be a priority for this administration when it comes to the Middle East. The first is, as Will pointed out, is undoubtedly Iran. Um, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action the Iran nuclear agreement was a signature uh, achievement of the Obama administration. And I, I think it's been clear uh, from the beginning of the campaign uh, that included multiple Democratic candidates all the way up through Joe Biden's nomination and now his transition is that he and Vice President Kamala Harris have a genuine interest in reopening a dialogue with the Iranians. This has broad support within the Democratic Party um, that believe that the President Trump's decision to withdraw from that agreement 
has only accelerated Iran's nuclear program and Iran's nuclear weapons program, which I think is self-evident. And that um, President Biden and his team believe that the best way to limit or hinder Iran's uh, nuclear program is through uh, either the JCPOA or some new agreement. I share Will's skepticism about uh, getting back into the old agreement or uh, the new agreement, uh, a possibility of a new agreement. Um, as I've written recently in an essay in Foreign Affairs that dealt with the region more broadly, uh, there is the possibility, and I think people have overlooked this fact, that a new agreement could also be destabilizing in the region. But clearly, Iran is a priority for President uh, Biden. And, and I'll get to how this, uh, how this is related to Iraq in a, in a minute. I think a second priority, although perhaps you know, not as high as some of the other ones, uh, is Palestine. Uh, it's very unclear what can be done at this point. Uh, given uh, the, over the course of the last four years, uh, the Israeli government has strengthened its grip on the West Bank. It has, in cooperation with the Egyptian government, maintained its blockade over the Gaza Strip, uh, and that there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of interest on either side for, uh, for negotiations. Nevertheless, nevertheless, um, the view, although uh, President-elect Biden uh, did welcome the Abraham Accords, uh, he was very quick to welcome them and said uh, kind words about uh, the agreement. Uh, there is a sense within uh, Democratic Party foreign policy thinking that leaving the Palestinians out um, is going to leave a destabilizing factor in the region. So uh, regardless of the fact that this is a conflict that, at least from my perspective, is one that uh, cannot be resolved, uh, I, I think that there will be a, a continued emphasis uh, within the Biden administration on what to do about uh, the Palestinians. Will made a, an interesting point about, uh, uh, about uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's relationship with the Obama administration. Um, I should point out that he had a difficult relationship with the Clinton administration before them. He seems to have a difficult relationship with, and, and even well before then, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he was a spokesman for the Israeli embassy in the early 1990s, uh, was declared persona non grata by uh, Secretary of State uh, James Baker for being disparaging remarks he made about the department and a number of uh, Secretary Baker's uh, advisors. So um, he uh, definitely um, is someone who uh, is a challenge for Washington to deal with. Although I suspect that Joe Biden, who has um, been involved in American foreign policy for a very long time, has a, a, a solid pro-Israel record, uh, is probably better positioned to manage uh, a relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu than either President Clinton, uh, who was wildly popular in Israel, or uh, President Obama. So I, I don't expect that we will go back to the days in which um, President Obama, uh, an American president, an Israeli leader, can. it's clear that they can not stand to be in the same room with each other. Uh, and I think that that'll be perhaps an advantage that uh, President Biden will have in trying to nudge the Israelis to at least do uh, the barest minimum with regard to the Palestinians, which would at least be an improvement over the course of the last four years. Uh, the third priority for uh, a Biden administration is going to be uh, human rights and political reform. Um, I think that many uh, folks in Washington recognize the um, debate, the perennial debate, the debate that we have all the time between interests and values, um, but they've also, and that interests and strategic interests often went out, but they've also been appalled by the fact that the president of the United States over the course of the last four years has seemingly endorsed some of the worst excesses of authoritarian leaders in the region. Uh, he may have been uh, engaged in a, 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 a distasteful attempted at humor when he referred to Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Sisi as his favorite dictator. Um, but uh, this was uh, a, a, a inappropriate. Um, it was inappropriate for the President of the United States to suggest that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman should come up with a better cover story for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. It is inappropriate for the President of the United States to remain absolutely silent on the accelerating purge in Turkey that makes Turkey one of the most repressive countries 
in the region um, based on the merely on the fact that he happens to like uh, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So I think that um, although there's probably very little that President Biden and his team can do in terms of fundamentally altering the condition of hu the, the, the human rights situation in the region and pushing political reform, I think you'll see an administration that is more willing to speak openly about it with uh, and, and the shortcomings of its partners in the region in this regard. Which leads me to this question of Saudi Arabia. I think that the dialogue in Washington, which is going to be another priority of uh, this administration, I think that the dialogue in Washington about Saudi Arabia has been um, more exhortation than, um, uh, than a, a sober uh, analysis of how and where our interests overlap and what why the relationship may or may no longer be as important to the United States uh, going forward. My hope is, given the, the, the serious national security team that President Biden is putting together, that they will be able to kind of push away a lot of the uh, discussion of Saudi Arabia that isn't grounded in cost-benefit analyses and really understand what it is that's important about, uh, about the relationship. I think that one of the differences in, in regard to Saudi Arabia will mention Turkey. I think uh, one of the differences that um, the administration is going to find in dealing with these two problematic partners, and in the case of Turkey, a NATO ally, is that with regard to Saudi Arabia, there's actually little that the United States can do in the short run in order to bring the Saudis to heel. Um, cutting off weapons sales to the Saudis uh, does little actually to bring the uh, conflict in Yemen to an end. Uh, and uh, in contrast, uh, there are a number of areas where the United States can, um, one, demonstrate that it remains a country where the rule of law prevails while holding Turkey to account. Nevertheless, I think Saudi Arabia, the, pre the president-elect's words during the campaign about the Saudis being beyond the pale and pariahs uh, should be a warning to folks in Riyadh that it, they are not going to have uh, the kind of uh, warm relations that they had with, uh, with the Trump administration, which brings me finally to Iraq, which it's, un for those of you in Iraq and those of you who are Iraqis, it's hard for me to find where on the priority list Iraq falls. I think it is lower than all of the issues that I just discussed. Um, uh, it, it, and as Will pointed out, Iraq policy over the course of the last 15 years have been about everything other than Iraq. Uh, and it has primarily been about Iran and extremism. And I, I, I wholeheartedly endorse his um, oblique uh, criticism of the Iraq debate being more about politics and refighting uh, the 2003 decision to invade. Um, but it is going to be about, uh, Iraq is going to be about Iraq. And I think that there's some good news in that and there's some bad news in that. One is that turning down, and any effort to turn down the heat in the US-Iran relationship may rebound positively for Iraqis who are caught in the middle between these two countries and do not want to be the battlefield between the United States and Iran. All that being said, I think those who are putting a lot of faith in that idea don't really understand how the Islamic Revolutionary Guard works and don't really understand and don't take lessons from the aftermath of the JCPOA in which the United States did clearly try to turn down the, the heat between the two countries and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps turned up the heat in other parts of the, the region. And as a result, I think um, that we shouldn't actually be um, looking forward to uh, Iraq no longer being the battlefield. But to second Will's uh, view, another four years of Donald Trump would have meant a, a, a complete withdrawal of American forces from Iraq. I think that the Biden team is going to be much more careful, especially after the withdrawal from Iraq in 2011. And the fact that uh, they will continue, in my hope, uh, it, to uh, maintain and perhaps even augment the security mission there gives Iraqis hope that they can um, bolster, their, uh, bolster their sovereignty 
and continue to fight uh, extremism in the country. As I have written, as I have told Dr. Munkuth any number of times, it's my view that there's not a lot that the United States can do with regard to Iraq's political situation, its political institutions. But in the area where we can make a difference is continue to bolster Iraqi sovereignty. And, and, and that is directly related to, uh, to Iran. And it's my hope that the uh, administration will, will, will do that. That will, however, run up against something else that is uh, going to affect Iraq in a major way. And that is the debate about America's drawing down in the region. Um, the invasion of Iraq, for those who want to end quote unquote forever wars, the invasion of Iraq is the original sin. And in order to correct that original sin, that means bringing Americans home from Iraq. Uh, and this is, I, and I agree with Will, there's a lot more heat, as we say, than there is fire. We still are the predominant power in the region. However, I think the debate about withdrawal is, uh, is real. I think that there are influential people uh, on, in both parties that are, uh, who advocate for this. Uh, and there's going to be political pressure on President Biden, especially since he is likely to be a one-term president, not because he uh, will lose in 2024, but because he is going to be the oldest person to take the oath of office, and he is likely to be a bridge to uh, his vice president-elect Kamala Harris. Uh, and there is going to be some tremendous pressure on the vice president to set out her own foreign policy vision. And there's going to be tremendous pressure from progressive wing of the Democratic Party for her to make some commitments about withdrawal. This is going to complicate Iraq policy. This is going to complicate the security mission. This is going to complicate what I believe we should do, which is augment the security mission in Iraq. This is a real, it's a bad idea to withdraw, but it's a real live one in Washington. And as Will pointed out, it is politically appealing to the American people. Uh, after two decades in the Middle East, uh, inconclusive uh, war in Iraq, uh, and very few of the goals that either the uh, George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, or the Trump administration had set out for itself have been achieved. Um, both President Obama and President Trump, the thing that they share uh, is a, a desire to see the United States uh, reduce its presence in the in the region. My view is, we can do that, but we have to do that in a in a in a smart way, not just end forever wars. And finally, I think that um, there is a sense that this is going to be a domestic policy presidency, and that uh, events in the Middle East, events that are not directly related to China events that are not directly related to our core interests in Europe, uh, events that um, are, don't directly affect the security of the United States are not going to be as important to uh, this administration. Um, in many ways, foreign policy begins at home. And as I started this talk, repairing America is going to be the way in which uh, the United States once again uh, is effective and constructive in the world. The current state of the country, I find it hard to believe uh, that we can be as effective as we once were. Um, like a, and that is both um, positive in some ways, uh, that the United States is going to turn inward and uh, repair uh, some of the damage that has been done. Um, mm -hmm. But it does leave our partners and allies in the region uh, somewhat vulnerable. I'll stop there. I really do very much look forward to uh, Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, shukran, uh, Steve Cook, on this conversation. If you allow me, I'll start with two questions. One to Steve and one to Will, and then we'll open the question. Steve, I'll start with you. First, as you mentioned, هذه الإدارة الجديدة ستكون بالدرجة الأولى إدارة معنية بالشؤون الداخلية الأمريكية وإلى درجة أقل 
بالشؤون الخارجيه الا العناوين الكبرى اللي حددتها. ونظرا الى تاريخ بايدن انه اولا كان مع الحرب ضد صدام حسين ثم تاب وتراجع عن ذلك وتزامن مع فتره بايدن مع فتره اوباما التي يعني انزوت عن الشرق الاوسط انسحبت او انسحبت اهتمامها عن الشرق الاوسط هل باعتقادك انه بايدن حقيقه راح يعني يحاول ان تو انجيج مع العراق يعني ان كان ب for better or worse الإدارة الأمريكية دائما من خلال سفارتها ومن خلال مجريات أخرى طرق أخرى حاولت أن تؤثر على السياسة الداخلية العراقية هل تعتقد أنه بايدن سيكون عنده معناته نفور من هذا الموضوع أو سأم من هذا الموضوع وسيقول لن لن تكون علاقتنا مع العراق بهذه الـ بهذا العمق الذي كانت عليه سابقا وسنحاول ان نبتعد عن السياسه العراقيه الداخليه هذا الى ستيف الى ويل السؤال حول ايران ولو انه اثنينكم ذكرتوا ايران ويل ذكرت انه بايدن براغماتيك رجل عملي اوكي لما نتحدث عن إعادة الحوار مع إيران هناك ثلاث أمور تذكر عادة طبعا أولا هو الموضوع النووي كاتفاق نووي ثانيا محور الصواريخ البالستية وثالثا هو محور التدخل الإيراني في المنطقة في سياسات المنطقة كان العراق لبنان اليمن إلى آخره هل كون بايدن رجل براغماتي سيعني أنه سيركز على الأمور فقط الموضوع النووي والموضوع البالستي ولن يتطرق إلى الأمور السياسية وتدخل إيران في الشؤون السياسية على أساس أنه هذا أمر بعيد المنال فلماذا أن ندخل فيه يدخل الجدل فيه خلينا نحقق إنجازات على النطاق النووي وعلى النطاق البالستي أما الأمور الأخرى فممكن أن نتحدث بها ولكن لا نتوقع أي إنجاز منها وشكرا uh, Will, do you want to go ahead since I had the last word before? Sure. Um, sure, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna take uh, 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 the liberty of at least making one comment on the question that was asked to you <laughs> as well. The, um, uh, right I, yeah. and I love, I love being with Steve on panels because we agree on so much. <laughs> the, uh, Same. Uh, the um, uh, as far as um, uh, Iran goes, um, um, I think that I do, I don't, I think that the uh, uh, the Biden administration will, like I said, very pragmatically look at what worked and what didn't work in the Obama administration. And while, while they see the, um, the nuclear agreement as being a positive um, and are proud of that uh, track record, I, I suspect, and I think you've seen some comments along these lines, that they recognize some of the weaknesses of that agreement. Um, and amongst the weaknesses that have become more evident that in fact have um, led to the, the United States withdrawing from the agreement is um, the lack of buy-in that, um, uh, that the Obama administration achieved from, uh, from the rest of the region and, uh, and, and key countries in particular um, in the Gulf uh, who feel directly, and Israel that felt directly threatened um, by, uh, uh, by Iran. Um, not only from a nuclear perspective, but also from some of the other malign behaviors um, that, Rand, uh, that Rand you raised. 
And so I think, I suspect that a Biden administration will, will recognize that it's impossible, that while you can have progress on individual elements, it's impossible to completely disassociate um, uh, all three of the uh, things that you talked about. Um, and then even just on the nuclear file, one of the, one of the stronger arguments in my view, against the JCPOA uh, was um, was frankly not the ones that were that I heard the loudest was that there was a time deadline. There's a there's a deadline, an expiration for almost every uh, arms control agreement, you know, um, out there, uh, bilateral arms control agreement. So I never I never bought that. Um, uh, uh, but the fact that unlike most arms control agreements, it only dealt with the weapon and not the means of delivery of that weapon. And that is a, um, uh, that to me was a, a, a more convincing critique of the, um, uh, of the agreement mm -hmm. as, it, as it stood. Um, so that means that the ballistic missile question, which, um, uh, which ran, uh, pushed very, very hard and what eventually was successful in those negotiations as, as uh, eliminating from the JCPOA uh, would, have to, would have to be on the table. Um, I, I, as I've already noted, I'm skeptical about the notion that you're going to get a new JCPOA. I'm even more skeptical at the notion that you would even have a grander bargain. Um, I've been in several administrations and I can't tell you how many times in the United States there's been a very vexing problem somewhere in the world and somebody around the table says, what we need to do is to have a wider holistic agreement about all of the issues under play, not because this little problem is so small, is so hard, we need to make it a bigger problem in order to solve it. And I've never seen that, I've seen that proposed many times, I've never seen it successful. Um, I haven't found examples where it's successful in, in the history of the world, but yet it keeps on being proposed. So I am, um, I'm skeptical that there'll be an agreement on the nuclear file. I'm more skeptical that there'll be an agreement on the wider set of Iranian malign uh, behaviors. But that means that you have to deal with those behaviors in di through different means. Um, and amongst those means are going to be political means, um, uh, in addition to being intelligence and, um, and military, uh, uh, and other covert, other covert means. So, um, so that's the answer to that question. And then as I hand it over to you, the only thing that I, that I will note is that um, uh, I agree completely with, with what you said, Steve, about the Biden administration's intent to be inwardly focused, um, especially during a pandemic and a recession and an incredibly divided American public that the election just reinforced um, again. There are all sorts of reasons why a Biden administration will want to, well, its first, second, and third priorities will need to be domestic. Uh, uh, at the same time, there will be people that will be working on the international affairs. Um, we can do two things at once. And I will note that when Bill Clinton came into office, he came into office saying that it was the economy stupid and had no time for international affairs, and then found himself uh, uh, involved in many um, uh, things. When George W. Bush came into office, he said that he wanted a humble foreign policy. Yeah, that was yeah. uh, that was the distinction that he wanted to make. Um, his foreign policy was anything but humble. Um, so sometimes uh, events in the world um, uh, define the agenda as much as our desires. Thank you. Um, Ren, to your question about Iraq, um, I, I think that there's some learning that's happened uh, over the years, and I it it strikes me that. Um, Biden administration will have an Iraq policy of some sort, um, it, but we will no longer be engaged in micromanage, trying to micromanage Iraqi politics. Uh, at least that's my hope. Uh, we have proven over many years that we don't understand it uh, and that um, we often aren't, uh, have little ability to be constructive. Uh, and that uh, quite honestly, some of our Iraqi partners haven't been entirely truthful with us yet we have uh, believed them. Um, in an odd way, I think that the, um, although the Trump administration was uh, intent on getting out of Iraq, um, I think one, of, one, one insight that they had, um, and I think this comes from Assistant Secretary uh, David Schenker, is that we 
the United States really should not have a view on who is the Iraqi prime minister, as long as that person is someone who is uh, not thoroughly penetrated by the Iranians. Um, and that, that, there, that we, we should not take a, a position uh, on behalf of one uh, group in Iraq or one uh, political leader or aspirant uh, or the other. And I, I think that that's likely to, to continue uh, going forward. Um, but uh, the days in which um, uh, then Vice President Biden flew into Iraq to sort of mediate among factions uh, is really long gone. And, and like I said, I think that the, my hope is the emphasis is of continuing the security mission and the continuing the counter extremism uh, mission. And I, my overall sense is that that is where uh, they're going to be. Um, just on, on Will's last point, I can't, I can't really let it go. It shouldn't be a debate between the two of us on this. And I certainly agree. Uh, every president comes and says it's going to be domestic politics. Of course, in a way, uh, comparing uh, uh, Clinton in 1993 to Biden in 2021 is really, as we say, comparing apples to oranges, or not even, not even, not even one kind of fruit to another kind of fruit, but a fruit to a vegetable. Um, and of course, it's true that um, they're going to be, and they're very good people thus far, have been nominated to work on. Uh, foreign policy for the Biden administration, but there are some things that really do require presidential attention. And while he is seeking to heal those wounds, and which was a, 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 the most important theme of his campaign, the question is how much time and effort will the president of the United States want to devote to a region where there hasn't been a lot of joy for Americans uh, for a, a long time? Um, it may be that he finds no joy in domestic politics and turns his attention to foreign policy and seeking opportunity there. But, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm older than I look and um, I, I, the, 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 state of the, the state of the country is um, of tremendous, tremendous concern. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, and thank you, Will. Uh, إذا ممكن دقيقة دكتور منقذ بس أريد جتنا أسئلة على الشات وجت أسئلة على Q A على الشات برفع الأيدي وعلى ال Q A كتابة فأنا رح أحاول أنه يعني أغطي الاثنين إذا ممكن خليني أطلب من دكتور منقذ كذلك عند شكراً سترانت مباشرة عندي سؤال لستيف وسؤال لويل ستيف أنت تعرف دائماً نحن عندنا هذا هذا النقاش حول الانفولفمنت أو مدى أهمية المنطقة بالنسبة إلى أمريكا والبرايورتيز مالتها هنا أنا يعني مرت يعني confused خلينا أقول بين شيئين ما قلته إنه بايدن راح يكون يركز على أجندة داخلية وأنا أتفق معك عنده أجندة داخلية كبيرة جدا و وأرث من من ترامب عليه أن يعالجه يعني يشتغل فايرمان حتى يطفي كل اللي سوا سوا ترامب بس بنفس الوقت من أقرأ المقال اللي كتبه بايدن في الفورن أفيرز بشهر ثلاثة هذه السنة عن سياسته الخارجية واضح إنه الرجل أيضا فورن فورن بوليسي أورينتيد يعني هو يركز على موضوع بحكم خلفيته يركز يركز على هذا وبالذات ذكر كثير موضوع أوروبا وروسيا ومنطقة الشرق الأوسط مهمة جدا إلى أوروبا وروسيا ويعني الباك يارد مال أوروبا هذه المنطقة أي آيسز أو غيرها تظهر مرة ثانية أو وهي موجودة كثير ممكن تأثر في سياسة 
ترامب العفو بايدن فما تعتقد انه هذا راح يخلي تركيز او يعطي تركيز على المنطقه هذا سؤال بنفس الوقت موضوع الميليشيات الايرانيه اريد اسال سؤال لو والان متوقع انه بعض الميليشيات تهدد بضرب المصالح الأمريكية في ذكرى اغتيال سليماني لو حصل ذلك وهو سيحصل أكيد في ظل إدارة ترامب يعني بالشهر واحد اغتيال لو حصل ذلك وتمت مهاجمة القوات أو المصالح الأمريكية انتقاماً ل ضرب سليماني او الاغتيال سليماني كيف سيكون ذا انا ذاك رد الفعل لبايدن وليس لترامب ترامب ممكن هذا بس بايدن ماذا سيعمل ازاء ذلك الى اول اذا ايران طلبت جارانتيز على المفاوضات حتى تضمن انه لا يحصل مره اخرى ان لا ياتي رئيس مره اخرى والاتفاقيه اذا حصلت يخرقها او يلغيها اذا طلبت جارانتيز ايران من الولايات المتحده الامريكيه تضمن انه لا ياتي اي رئيس ويلغي الاتفاقيه كما فعل ترامب فهل تعتقد انه بايدن سيكون جاهز لاعطاء مثل او الكونغرس حتى يكون جاهز ان يعطي مثل هذه الجارانتيز وايضا اريدك تتكلم لي عن موضوع الميليشيات هذا السيناريو اذا الميليشيات ضربت شكرا sure would you like me to be me to start yeah go ahead will Well, okay. yeah. So um, uh, uh, let me let me give a quick answer. You know, the um, the challenge that the Obama administration had was that they could not make the nuclear agreement a formal treaty, which would require congressional action, um, uh, because they didn't have the votes um, in the Senate to support such a such a treaty. So they tried to um, uh, do as much as they possibly could. to uh, prevent, uh, to, to, you know, to, to make the agreement permanent by not only making executive action, but by bringing it to the UN Security Council, but by having so many other countries uh, 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 involved in it, they wanted to make, and of course, they expected that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win the next election, as many of us did at the time. So, um, uh, and the longer that an agreement is in place, uh, the harder it is to undo an agreement, just as, as it's natural. Um, Hillary Clinton did not win, Donald Trump did, and Donald Trump, uh, and it must be stated, against the advice of his then Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and National Security Advisor, all of them advised for him not to withdraw from the JCPOA, and he did it anyway. Um, uh, uh, and so where will Joe Biden be? Um, Joe Biden will have uh, at best, if some continuing elections in the Senate in the state of Georgia uh, go the best way possible, he will have the most narrow majority that you can have in the Senate and an even more narrow majority in the House at the end of the election. That's no position to be able to pass a, uh, a treaty through the Senate. So if, uh, if Iran proposes, if Iran demands a formal treaty, uh, that will be the easiest way to see that no follow-on agreement uh, will be possible. Um, uh, just very quickly about, uh, about what would happen if Iran or Iran's proxies um, carry out a retaliatory uh, assassination. 
um, in response to the killing of, uh, of uh, Soleimani. Um, what would the Biden administration do about this? Um, I think the fundamental question is it depends. Um, it depends on were they successful or not. It depends on who they targeted. It depends on where they targeted. All these things will, um, uh, Iran has uh, what, um, what one a longtime Iran watcher once explained to me as a peculiar sense of symmetry in their actions. Um, and the United States also has what can be sometimes seen as a peculiar sense of proportionality in its responses. Um, I, will, I will note, as, as everyone in, our, in Iraq will remember, that when Saddam Hussein tried unsuccessfully to assassinate George H.W. Bush um, during the Clinton administration, uh, Bill Clinton um, uh, did um, attacks by a, a missile um, on, uh, uh, on, on uh, Iraqi territory. And that was for an unsuccessful attack, attempt against the president of the United States, a former president of the United States. So these things get, um, get weighed in this way. Um, to Mulcahy's point about Joe Biden's foreign affairs article and his foreign policy experience, Mulcahy, first, I, I, let me just say that I read your um, article that analyzed what uh, President-elect Biden had said in foreign affairs, which I think is important. But I also think, keep in mind that every presidential candidate has a foreign policy and, and seeks to get it out to broad audience. And because foreign affairs is really the flagship journal uh, of the foreign policy establishment, um, it, every presidential candidate, uh, with perhaps the exception of President Trump this, this time out, um, has contributed their view of foreign policy. Um, I don't mean to create the impression that foreign policy is unimportant to President-elect Joe Biden and the Vice President-elect. That's not true. We are still the United States of America and we still have tremendous interests uh, around the world that um, we will endeavor to protect. And we have responsibilities around the world that we will endeavor to uh, fulfill. All that being said, I think we, even with his vast experience in foreign policy, even with his um, you know, uh, way in which he understands how these regions are connected, how the Middle East is connected to Russia, how the Middle East is connected to Europe, that um, in order to have an active foreign policy in parts of the world, you do not only need your party's support, but you also need the American people's support. Um, and I don't think that um, the President Biden has either his party support in Congress, nor does he have the American people's support for a particularly active uh, foreign policy in the Middle East. Um, and which is why many of us in the, in the kind of foreign policy expert world have been suggesting that rather than withdrawing from the region, that the United States rationalize its approach to the region, that it matches uh, resources to goals that are important to the United States, not to things that those of us who work in the foreign policy community uh, can think of that might be important because that's something that interests us. Uh, and that is, if I don't mind plugging myself, the, the, the topic of uh, an essay that I have in foreign affairs in November and December uh, entitled No Exit, Why the Middle East is Still Important to America. But what I do is I draw out what is actually remains important to the United States and where we should devote our resources to it. One of those places is Iraq, which I have articulated um, that the security mission in Iraq remains, uh, remains uh, important. The, uh, again, I think the inclination of President Biden is to focus his attention on the United States. That does not mean that we don't have a foreign policy. That does not mean that the Middle East isn't important. But I do think that there are changes afoot. Um, and then there are very significant debates going forward, not just between Democrats and Republicans, but among Republicans themselves and among Democrats themselves about America's role in the world. And that is... I think a function of what we are referring to is the post-American post world. This is 30 years after the end of the Cold War. 
that this period of American primacy where the United States is the only power and got to order the world is, has come to a close or is rapidly coming to a close. That doesn't mean that we still aren't the most powerful country on earth and we still don't have a tremendous amount of force to bring to bear, but that there are, as Will pointed out, both global and regional actors that um, are, are making bids of their own to um, be important actors in the region. And the question is whether Americans care whether the Turks or the Russians or the Chinese or some combination of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Israel are seeking to establish what we would say in American vernacular, the rules of the road in the region. الحقيقة اللي قال ستيف يعني أكو سؤال يصب في هذا الموضوع بالذات ستيف إذا ممكن أقول لك السؤال أنه ما هي نظرة بايدن إلى الأمريكا في العالم وهل يجد أنه الولايات المتحدة هي دولة قيادية أو الدولة القيادية في العالم؟ وما هي نظرته لهذا الدور إذا كان عنده نظرة لهذا الدور لأمريكا كدولة قيادية نظرا إلى التزاحم الذي يحصل من روسيا والصين في منطقة الشرق الأوسط يعني أين يجد بايدن موقع أمريكا كدولة قيادية في المنطقة بالنسبة إلى محاولات روسيا والصين على التدخل في المنطقة هذا أحد الأسئلة التي أجدنا تفضل ستيف السؤال إليك Great, thank you um, and, and I invite uh, actually, you know I, I, I don't invite, I, I want to um, pivot off something that Will said that I think was that was important is that um, the world is a very different place than it was. Um, and that um, I think that President-elect Biden is gonna confront uh, a situation that I think that he's well aware of, um, but that it is not just going to be a matter of the president saying we're back, which he has said. And I think that there is going to be a genuine effort on the part of the administration to demonstrate American leadership. Uh, I don't expect that President elect Biden's first foreign trip is going to be to Saudi Arabia. I think he will reestablish the tradition that his first foreign trip will be to Canada. And then he will go to Europe. And then he will seek to repair relations with countries like South Korea. Europe, whole, free and prosperous is of utmost importance to the United States. That is our core interest in the world. And I think that even there, the president of the United States is going to find that the last four years have been, as, as much as he's going to be welcomed by each and every European leader, with the exception of perhaps the Polish and Hungarian leaders, uh, he is going to find, he's going to find that there is um, questions in the minds of European leaders about the Trump era and whether it will come back and the fact that 70 million plus Americans voted for President Trump. And that when President Biden says we're back and we're ready to lead, whether that is something that is real. Um, I certainly think that in President-elect Biden's mind, we are, the United States is. It is unrivaled, it is a beacon of freedom. It is um, uh, a country that is, uh, to use a much maligned word these days in Washington, exceptional. But that is why I think much of his attention is going to be focused on repairing the damage to the country that has occurred, not just the past the, uh, in the immediate four years of the Trump era, but we have been um, the, the post September 11, 2001 era in the United States has distorted our domestic politics, distorted our economics, and had profound effects on American society. Um, in terms of challenging Russia or China, I think Will was right. China is power and presence in the region is primarily economic and mercantilist. Uh, it has not yet 
uh, demonstrated it wants to uh, become more directly involved in either the politics or geopolitics uh, of the region. And Russia's primary interest in the Middle East, to my mind, isn't necessarily about the Middle East, but it is about um, so about creating questions about American leadership in the world and um, creating questions in Europe about American leadership in the world. And I will imagine that the Russians will continue to do that. Um, I think the one thing, one of the great achievements of Donald Trump in the past four years is to convince Democrats of the malign intentions of the Russians. You remember during the 2012 election, presidential candidate, Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney said that the greatest challenge to America, foreign policy challenge to America was Russia. And President Obama's response was to quip in a joke that 1985 had called and would like its foreign policy back. Um, we have seen a complete reversal of that. And I think that, that's a, I think that that's a positive thing because I think the Russians' intentions with regard to the United States are malign. And I think, and, the, and Europe are maligned. And I think that one of the tools that he has sought to use are American missteps in the Middle East. Shukran, Steve. Al-Afu, khallini athkur ism li al-shakhs li sa'al al-su'al li huwa muntasar majid. Antaqal ila su'al akhar min مشارك باسم بسمان ويسأل أو تسأل عن أنه هل بايدن الذي في 2007 على ما أعتقد وكذلك كان توني بلينكن هو الشيف of staff لما كان بايدن في مجلس الشيوخ و يعني طلعوا فكرة أنه تقسيم العراق إلى ثلاث أقاليم مبنية على الأرق والطائفة والمذهب وإلى آخره شيعة سنة أكراد إلى آخره وهذا كان يعني كانت ردة فعل عراقية قوية ضد هذا الموضوع إلى أي مدى تعتقدون أنه بايدن ما يزال متمسك بهذه الفكرة و إلى أي مدى سيحاول أن يطبقها في العراق والسؤال مطروح إلى أي يعني أي شخص Sure um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it um, I think there are two things um, or three things maybe First uh, the actual proposal that was made back then um, is uh, has been uh, misinterpreted um, uh, quite significantly. Um, there was never a proposal to divide Iraq. Um, uh, there was a proposal for a more federalized state um, in Iraq. Um, it was it was done in the context of an American domestic political debate um, at the time, and uh, and it was very much informed by the defining experience that, um, that many Democrats had of knitting a multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian country together in Bosnia. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was seen as a alternative to the, um, uh, to the surge type approach. Um, and the uh, then uh, Bush administration, um, recognizing the challenge that it was facing politically because of it, domestically, um, intentionally mischaracterized it, uh, both domestically in the United States and in conversations with Iraq. And this is this is yet another example of um, of Iraq policy in the United States not really being about Iraq but being about trying to win political debates uh, at home. And so uh, one thing that I strongly encourage uh, the folks that are listening to this is not to take your perception of, uh, of Joe Biden from the, the narrative that was being uh, given 
by Joe Biden's domestic political opposition uh, in the United States at the time, who who intended to make it look bad, you know the uh, so, uh, but this is why U.S. domestic political debates can have long-term foreign policy implications that are quite that are quite negative when these uh, when these debates um, uh, when these narratives that are not true continue. Now that said, I think that uh, I think that uh, Biden has long viewed Iraq as being uh, as having a significant sectarian challenges, um, and I think that um, I think that those will be on his mind. At the same time, Iraq has changed uh, uh, since those days, and there are significant movements that are trying to move away from sectarian uh, ism as the central focus of uh, a defining feature of Iraqi uh, politics. And I think that those, I suspect that those will be very uh, welcome in a Biden administration. Uh, Let me just say, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Will had to say. This is a, a proposal that was profoundly misinterpreted. Um, and let me just add one thing that he said at the end. I think that the one of the results of the American invasion was to highlight and brighten and deepen the sectarian nature of Iraqi politics in a way that um, was that that then Senator Biden was trying to address um, through uh, a, a, I guess you'd call it hyper federalism, but the, the goal was to actually keep the country together as one. Uh, إلى بعض الأيادي المرفوعة لأن ما بقى عندنا وقت إذا ممكن أستاذ مازن صاحب يمكن أول شخص رح أنطيك الكلام تفضل أستاذ مازن أستاذ مازن نعم السلام عليكم تفضل سؤالك شكرا جزيلا سؤالي إلى ايميل باحث اولا شكرا جزيلا للمستقله وشكرا جزيلا للساعه السفيره على هذه الندوه المهمه على شخصيا كصحفي وكمراقب سياسي في العراق اعتقد حسب معلومات انه بايدن زار العراق ل 24 مره هاي ال 24 مره تعامل فيها مع مختلف انواع الطيف السياسي الموجودين في العراق وهناك صداقات وصوره شخصيه عندما فاز بايدن نشرت في مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي لهذه الشخصيات السياسية العراقية السؤال هنا كيف يمكن لبايدن أن يتعامل مع ثنائية النفوذ الإيراني وثنائية العودة داعش إلى العراق شكرا جزيلا Either one of you, gentlemen. Steve, do you want to you want to jump in, or you want me to? Happy to do so. I, I I just have a very quick response to it, and then Will, you can pick up. I, I think that the the Biden team will, and they have signaled that reengaging with Iran is a potential way out of uh, the two problems that. Uh, uh, were outlined. One, the problem of Iraqi sovereignty and the problem of, of ISIS. Um, more the former rather than the latter. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, I think that there is some belief that a, an updated uh, agreement with the Iranians that addresses a broader range of issues will uh, diminish the likelihood that Iraq is a, a battlefield between the United States and Iran. I'm skeptical of that, given Iran's behavior after the signing of the JCPOA. But nevertheless, that is what it seems to me that the Biden team is signaling um, that they can and will want to engage Iran on a broad range of issues. Uh, and obviously, one of those is going to be um, Iran's influence in Iraq. Um, it seems to me that not likely they may be able to get have some progress in some areas, but given that Iraq is of tremendous importance to Iran in terms of keeping it weak and unstable uh, and vassalized, I don't know if you can interpret into Arabic vassalized, make it a, a client of sorts 
of of Iran, um, it, it, it strikes me that they're not likely to to get there, uh, to get very far on this issue. When it comes to ISIS in Iraq, this is why I have been quite vocal uh, recently in my suggestion that although it strikes me that there's very little that the United States can do uh, to make Iraqi politics better, that's up to Iraqis, that we do have the ability to um, use our security assistance and our security mission in coordination with our, some of our NATO allies to help continue to put pressure, to help the Iraqis continue to put pressure on ISIS and keep uh, those extremists um, at bay. Although I don't believe that there's ever going to be a, a final solution to this problem. I, I agree with what Steve, um, uh, Stephen just said, but uh, I'll just add a few things. When it comes to the Islamic State or Al Qaeda or whatever name that the Salafi jihadists go come uh, name call themselves in the next generation, um, you know, the United States has tried a lot of different approaches uh, uh, and and found them wanting. Um, it's they've tried invasion and occupation and that's not the right answer. It's tried just dropping hellfires from the sky and that's not the right answer. The right answer is indirect action working by, with, and through your partners and work and keep having a level of consistency uh, in commitment uh, with those partners, a consistency that was uh, uh, reduced, um, uh, unfortunately, after 2011, that um, helped allow for um, uh, for the Islamic State to um, to take Mosul. Um, I I suspect that that approach, the indirect approach, the consistency of working, will be will be at a core of uh, Biden administration's approach. And you've seen some um, some evidence of this both in Iraq and and elsewhere uh, when it comes to counterterrorism. You've seen some evidence of this. In, in, in things that Biden has said personally and things that Tony Blinken has said, um, that Jake Sullivan um, has said. Uh, 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 and of course that requires the underlying grievances of the Sunni uh, population to uh, be, ad be addressed. Um, uh, uh, so we can't, um, and that the fundamental challenge is that Iran, listen, no matter who is running Iran, if, if, uh, if, if Rend was somehow becomes the president of Iran tomorrow, <laughs> um, she would have national security interests in Iraq and those national security, in, uh, a country that has invaded Iran, um, those national security interests would be to make sure that they're on good terms and that they're um, not likely to invade uh, again. Um, uh, similar to the way that France thinks about Germany, you know, say. Um, the, the challenge is that the way that this Iranian regime has chosen uh, a policy to achieve those goals is exact is not by develop uh, primarily by developing uh, good um, relations and respecting each other's sovereignty and uh, ensuring that uh, countries are are um, uh, uh, evolve in friendship but by trying the Lebanonization approach that the IRGC knows so well of keeping a country uh, weak and divided with, uh, without um, the, um, uh, the, the monopoly on the legitimate use of force in the eyes of a significant proportion of its population. And that's fundamentally dangerous for Iraq. Um, and it is fundamentally counterproductive when you look at Sunni uh, uh, interests for our counterterrorism uh, goals, and that's what we've seen again and again. So, so, um, uh, so that's the that's the challenge that Iran fundamentally um, plays. Um, you know, I, I I want to say something very briefly in English. I think if the Biden administration imagines that an easing of tensions between the U.S. and Iran is going to favorably affect conditions in Iraq and that it'll mean less interference of Iran in Iraq, then they, the Biden administration needs to be rapidly disabused of that belief. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, 
ايضا رافع ايدها عندي هوايه اسئله وما راح نلحق لان يمكن عندنا ممكن ناخذ بعد فد خمس دقائق اوكي دكتور منقذ تفضل دكتور محمود يمكن دكتور محمود داغر ما اعرف اذا موجود ها زين ننتقل الى استاذ حميد الكفائي استاذ ها عفوا استاذ محمود موجود و تفضل استاذ محمود اذا ممكن تسال سؤالك بس اذا ممكن السؤال يكون مختصر لان ما عندنا وقت دكتور محمود دكتور محمود بدك تسمعنا ممكن يكون رافع ايده بالغلط يلا أه عفوا دكتور محمود يعني مدى ها يمكن دقيقة يمكن أنا لازم أسوي لك أن ميوت يس زين أفتكر هو أن ميوت هسه لا لا والله مدى يمكن مدى أقدر أوس تو أن ميوت أوكي ال ال الستراند اللي يوت من عنده بس ممكن يمكن العفو لو دكتور محمود لو استاذ حميد اذا ممكن انا جاهز يلا استاذ حميد تفضل ثانك يو فيري ماتش راند بريفلي اي وود لايك تو ثانك ايفريبادي I think one of the, um, the speakers or both of them said that Iraq is not a priority uh, for the Biden administration. I think um, this is um, a tragedy if, if, if it is um, the case because Iraq should be a priority. However, if Iran is a priority, then Iraq must be because the, the, both of them are linked. Um, Iraq needs um, the United States to stand by the forces of democracy. Um, the U.S. has gone into Iraq, invaded Iraq, brought down the state, um, and allowed, in a way, allowed Iran. It made it possible for, for Iran to take over Iraq. This is a moral responsibility. Um, and uh, talking of the Democrats as people of uh, principles and especially President Biden, um, judging by his history and ethical stances, I think he should stand with the forces of democracy and human rights in Iraq. Iran has taken over Iraq by armed groups, um, not by the will of the people. People of Iraq reject Iranian regime and the Iranian interference, but uh, by armed groups, um, they have, they are now really controlling Iraq. And uh, to take up uh, Will's point, last point that, uh, um, you know, there is some sort of security concerns, Iranian security concerns regarding Iraq. This is not the case. Iraq has never been um, a threat to Iran as far um, as the Iranian, Iraqi Iran war that uh, is concerned, that was really not the choice of Iraq. Iraq was pushed into it by many countries, um, among which was the United States. Um, people like Rand and I and many millions of Iraqis would like Iraq to be an ally of the United States. Um, but unfortunately, the United States has chosen to abandon Iraq. It's not really good for its credibility in the world if the United States just invade Iraq hand it over to Iran and just leave. It's really not a moral stance and it's not good for the U.S. long-term credibility and interest. Thank you very much. Do, do you want to answer this or is it a comment? Well, I would like to hear from them briefly if they could, please. I don't think you're going to get any disagreement from us that uh, the United States should not abandon uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, we we form, we firmly um, I think I can speak for for Stephen in this um, because he he wrote a very good article which I'll hold up right here um, and and uh, uh, for him in the latest form. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's always nice when someone else does it. 
<laughs> about um, uh, about exactly why we should not um, uh, abandon uh, Iraq. Um, I think that uh, uh, I, 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 I agree that um, with Stephen that the initial um, priorities, when you look at the entire set of responsibilities that the U.S. president has across all of the work that he has to do, the top priorities are domestic in nature, given where we are um, as a country. Um, but that does not mean that the United States doesn't have a foreign policy. And that doesn't mean that the, that the United States, and it doesn't mean that um, the people, you know, the, there's a reason why if you look at who President Biden has chosen to be his foreign policy advisors, uh, first he announced them even, bef even before he announced many domestic policy advisors. But they're, they're, the second thing is that they're all people that have worked with him for many, many years. These are people that he trusts, he cares about these issues. Um, I do suspect that, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, we will not be abandoning Iraq. Uh, let me just add very quickly that uh, once again, Will and I are in agreement. I do think that um, even though uh, managing Iraqi politics is not going to be a priority for the United States. I think that the, a Biden administration will absolutely support forces of democracy in Iraq. I do think that a Biden administration will absolutely oppose Iranian influence in Iraq, but both of those things will come in the form of rhetoric. Uh, we will do what we can in terms of our security mission, but um, I think that those other things will be essentially expressed from the podium of the State Department, expressing deep concern about Iranian behavior or uh, our tremendous, our long term, long time support for Iraqi sovereignty and democracy. Uh, beyond that, I don't think that we can uh, expect the United States to do it. After all, um, as I think as seasoned and talented as the national security team is so far, this was not their war. Um, many of these people uh, were people on the outside who didn't support the invasion uh, and don't necessarily, all these years later, want to continue to be responsible for it, its outcome. That's, a, that's not a great way of looking at it. And I certainly agree that it is um, uh, Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, the way it unfolded and what has transpired since has been a stain on the country and a, 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 a series of strategic errors that have contributed to um, questions about the United States and its reliability in the world. Can we exploit you for one more, or, or do you need to, can we? I, I can be exploited for, for just one more, absolutely. One, okay. As long as it's uh, a friendly I, exploitation. Mr. Amar al who is from Vienna. I will give him, it, but we'll, we'll be very quick. Okay. So I need to. Uh, so do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah, are you hearing me? It's uh, Maoni? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, just my, uh, brief. Final question. Akhir, Akhir yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a, very, a very short and brief question. Uh, for me as a European politician and as a Iraqi origin, I would, uh, for us, is essential what's going to happen in the, in the, in the situation in Syria. I didn't hear anything about uh, your, uh, your prediction, what will be the policy there, because I think it will affect both uh, the Iraqi uh, things, this is there, our neighbors and the IS came from there. And the second thing, what's going to happen with the or refugee migration and movements toward Europe. Yeah, I'm, well, I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic on, on Syria, quite frankly. I, I think it's very good that um, Tony Blinken, you know, the, the next Secretary of State, has said that Syria is the greatest um, uh, mistake that the uh, Obama administration made. I think that that is a very healthy and appropriate um, uh, uh, lesson. Uh, to be learned from that that experience, um, I I suspect that the uh, the mission, the military mission uh, with the Kurds in the um, in the eastern or so the southeastern part of the of the country will uh, will remain. I don't see a, 
a strong um, uh, push to uh, uh, to pull to pull that out. But in terms of um, uh, other major um, uh, uh, you know areas of progress, um, I don't see that much. There will be you know. President Trump had zero interest in the United States contributing to um, uh, uh, rebuilding um, in uh, in Syria. Um, if uh, I imagine that the Biden administration will have you know, only slightly more, you know, one percent, you know, uh, uh, interest in such in such a in such a situation. Um, uh, so I, I'm not very optimistic. I don't know, Stephen, if you have different views. Uh, I, I was equally warmed by uh, Secretary of State designate Blinken's uh, regret over Syria, given the fact that in February 2012, I wrote a piece saying that the United States should consider intervening in Syria to forestall both a humanitarian crisis and to improve its strategic position vis-a-vis -vis Iran, only to be told that I was a warmonger and I should go away. So um, I'm glad that he's come around uh, to that. But now here we are all these years later, and it's hard to imagine what it is that we can be doing. There was a moment uh, in the last uh, four years where uh, the United States could have cobbled together uh, a group of like-minded allies uh, to um, counter both the Russians and the Iranians in Syria, not necessarily militarily, although it would have been helpful in, in the North, in the Northeast, and even the Northwest to have a, a, a genuine NATO mission rather than the Turks freelancing it, and pursuing their interests regardless of uh, its allies in the region. I suspect that that time has passed. I suspect the, Congre the Congress would not support that. I suspect the American people would not support that. One of the things that the Trump administration has done, which is uh, quite interesting, has been to block uh, through sanctions and threat of sanctions any number of countries, including countries in the region who'd like to participate in the reconstruction of Syria, thus denying Bashar al-Assad and his supporters the resources necessary to keep them all together. And it has had a, 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 a negative effect on the regime there. The question is, and is everything with the Trump administration, did it think through, that's a rhetorical question, did it think through what the consequences of this were? What would happen if the Assad regime were to fall in on itself, what would be the next step? And I don't think that the Trump administration ever gave that uh, one moment of uh, one moment of thought while they were applying pressure on a variety of countries. So um, perhaps uh, a Biden administration will give that um, a greater consideration. But like Will, I'm deeply, deeply pessimistic about a favorable diplomatic outcome and a political transition in Syria. Um, most civil wars last seven to 15 years. Um, if that is the case with Syria, we are now entering uh, into the, the back end of that. Uh, it'll be a decade in March. Um, and I think um, we're just going to see uh, new phases of this conflict. Uh, as time goes on, I, I don't see what tools the United States has at this point um, to bring this to a, a conclusion, unfortunately. طبعا عندنا اسئله كثيره وايادي مرفوعه بس يعني تعدينا الوقت بفتره احب اشكر استاذ ستيف كوك وويل وكسلر لندوه جدا شيقه ومفيده جدا أنا استفدت الكثير إن شاء الله تكونوا أنتم استفدتوا أشكر دكتور منقذ لتسهيل حصول هاي الندوة وأشكر مترجمتنا الرائعة وآسفة أنه ما قدرنا نأخذ كل الأسئلة وكل الأيادي المرفوعة أنا بس أريد أشكرهم لأنه هم قبلوا الدعوة في الثانكس جيفين هوليدي أي طبعا طبعا ممنون جدا شكرا جزيلا ستيف شكرا جزيلا ويل على قبولكم الدعوة it was really 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 uh, very productive uh, and very interesting yes very interesting أنا عندي ردود الأفعال أنا تجيني ردود and I've got a I've got a proposal for you Will I'm always I've always got proposals
Wonderful. We'll get to that later. يلا مع السلامة جميعا شكرا لمشاهدة السلام شكرا جزيلا لا أشوفك إن شاء الله. Yeah.